Well, hi everyone. Welcome to Caterpillar's Digging Into History. I'm your host, Rusty Dunn. Sitting alongside me, the person who helps bring Caterpillar history to life, Corporate Heritage Archives Manager, Lee Fosberg. Lee, great to be with you again. How are you? Good seeing you again, Rusty. Somehow have come up with another great story and an unbelievable artifact well, behind you, us. We have two, you think about, we have a couple great stories here. And one is, right, for the, we dedicate this to all the history nerds, right? We were just geeking out about this engine because this is really, this is the cat first diesel engine. This is the prototype of what really started a revolution during a time of, you know, right? Uh, an, an industry change within how we power our machines. Absolutely, it's it's sort of a, a story about Caterpillar's uh, early energy transition, in a way. The story of Old Betsy, the nickname given to this diesel engine, the first mass-produced in America diesel engine that would go into a vehicle, uh, known as the D9900 officially. Uh, and it's right here at the Peoria Riverfront Museum, borrowed from the Smithsonian, which we donated to, and we'll talk about that. But first of its kind, one of a kind, prototype. What's the backstory on this, Lee? Well, this backstory even goes back to like the late 1800s. Rudolf Diesel invents the diesel engine. The first one that's actually practically used in America was around 1898. But the World's Fair in 1915 was where it really had an impact on what would become actually Caterpillar. It was our predecessor. And our founder, C.L. Best, said like, how can we put this into a Caterpillar tractor. And one of the main reasons is, right, they were more efficient. They actually made money on their efficiencies for our customer, right? We've always been about that. So the decision got made, this is our future. This is yes. what we have to have to do. That we have to do. And so the company merged with Holt and Best in 1925. It becomes Caterpillar, right? But really about 1927, they do the initial kind of phase of researching a diesel engine because at this time diesel engines they were big machines they were either stationary engines or they went into like things like marine applications so they had their work cut out for them so about 18 months going before 1931 or 1930 this machine came out it was successful and it led to our first production engines that were put in tractors in 1931. What kind of team did they put together back then in terms of um, put, you know, inventing, er, developing the D9900, or was there one person, you're in charge, make it happen? So, it, believe it or not, I mean, how times have changed, right? Our, our, our president, or our first chairman, C.L. Best, he was the project manager, you would say. But the chief engineer was a guy called Art Rosen. Art Rosen had been in this business for a while with diesel, so we kind of hired an, ex, an expert who went on to having a long career at Caterpillar. So talk about the, uh, we've touched on the development. When did we start then to get into production of the first models so, that were produced? So the end of 1931, you had the first production models. The first few came off the assembly line in California, because that's where we had research Oh, in California, okay. Yeah, yeah, they were built by hand, and then that production was moved to Peoria, Illinois. Talk about the investment, and this, and again, this is at a, a, a kind of a risky time in, yeah. in, in the country's history yes. with the depression. And but we made a decision: we have to win with this project. Yeah, and, and one was they realized they had to win because what people were doing were taking Caterpillar tractors, removing the gasoline engines, and putting in diesel engines. Now, none of them were successful. But they realized if we don't move on this, right, someone else will. So we have to be the leader. So you had an investment, right, of over a million dollars walking into the Great Depression. There were actually shareholders that were uncomfortable with this, but our leadership was like, no, we need to keep this going. We need to be this leader, and that's what we did. Talk about the classic I mean, risk-reward calculation that you'd mm -hmm. have to have to do, and in this case, the future of Caterpillar, de depending on it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, Lee, all right, catch us up then. This, uh, the production was, actually, the D9900 had a good run. Was it discontinued then at some point as we move forward? Yeah, so it ran for a few years. Again, remember, we only had one on the line, right, one model. Right. But then we came out with three other models and it went off the line because it was really kind of a learning. In a certain way, 
it was like kind of a prototype sold into the field. They had learnings from that machine, which they put into the machines, you know, that came out like in around 1933, 1934. So with this original prototype, and, and I know you would argue it's, it's one of Caterpillar's most valuable mm -hmm. artifacts, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of them out there. Mm -hmm. But the journey of, of old Betsy, uh, it, this thing could have gone either way. It's sitting with us today, but that, it had things gone a different way, that may not be the case. That yeah. might not have been the case. Yeah, well, so Caterpillar had research and development up until the late 30s um, in California. So when they closed that up, they shipped this back where it was kept in Eves Peoria for a long time. But then you had World War II breakout, where a lot of companies were told, essentially, you need to scrap a lot of metal, right, for the war effort. So, you, right, like scrap yeah. what you can, melt things down, mm -hmm. and and that's, that was almost the fate here. It was almost the fate here, but a person called Charlie Shad, who was actually part of the engineering part of creating this, he had the foresight, he created it up and he hid it. <laughs> he hid he, it. He, he, he literally, he realized yeah. that he knew that it would be among the other pieces of scrap, melted, melted yeah. down and yeah. knew the importance yeah. of, and, of this. And so piece. the story is when we opened the tech center, you know, which came out at you know, in the early 1960s, it was brought over there with you know a lot of other prototypes. It was kind of refound again, and Charlie Shad was around, right? So he had this thing restored, if you want to call that, repainted, and they actually even tested it, you know, to see if it hit the new you know EPA standards of the 1970s of the yeah. you know the Clean Air Act, which believe it or not, it did, which is kind of amazing, <laughs> right? Because it, it was made in the 1930s. Um, but the other little funny backstory is right. No one knew it was painted gray because right originally when this was made in 1930, our machines were still gray. They hadn't turned yellow yet. So, right, right. So they eventually right saw this and said, you know, we think this is a museum quality piece. This is a piece of American history. They contacted the Smithsonian. They wanted it. They added it to their collection and they restored it again and painted it gray. A big thank you going out to Charlie uh, yeah. and, and for, for having the foresight to mm -hmm. sa save old Betsy. So it gets donated to the Smithsonian with our very first donation or no, um, no. to the museum? Well, actually, um, before that, uh, probably a decade before that, we donated um, what was Benjamin Holt's first combine harvester. Now, Benjamin Holt, who's seen as one of our founders, he didn't invent the combine harvester, but he made improvements to it, which it became very revolutionary, and they had collected that years before. Wow. So we had been there, done that, right? And we're, we're doing that today. So ultimately, put it in perspective and context, Lee, this really made us, at the time, the almost overnight leader in, in, in diesel product, or is that exaggerating a little bit? Well, this is the story that I love, right? This was transformational for the company. Three years later, we produced with our engines over the half the diesel horsepower in the US. So that was, I mean, we became from probably a small to medium sized company to kind of the company that we are today. And it was all because of this isn't prototype. It, isn't it amazing, you know, as we talk about the history and, and the energy transition and, at the time, just as you mentioned, transformational. And it's still that today as we go forward with, with future generations. Absolutely, you think about Rusty, so right, we're talking about things like electrification today, like, you know, uh, the people doing our job, like 50 years from now, they'll be talking about one of those engines, right? This is just one piece of an ongoing kind of timeline yep, you or sort a puzzle. Of understand you're standing on the shoulders of others, those yep. that came, came before us. Lee, mm -hmm. thank you so much. As always, uh, some, uh, some great stories. Once again, we appreciate you setting this up for us. Thanks, Rusty. I'm gonna go back to being geeking out again. And I'm joining that club too. I wasn't an original member, but I am I'm now right there with you. All right, well, thank you everyone for watching this latest episode of Digging Into History. Always glad to bring you these stories. As always, go be safe in everything that you do. Have a great day.